Hello. It's me, not Cabbage. Actually, it's the Blue Shifting. How's it going? Welcome to the Blue Shifting. Welcome to the Rat Party. <coughs> Excuse me. Rat Party is simply when I do a follow wrap up of a piece of content I've been doing. So this is it for Cooking Companion. It's a shorter video uh, series, but I actually thought it was going to be much shorter than it turned out to be. Uh, if you're listening to this live, welcome. Thank you so much for joining me. This is just a chance for me to get my thoughts out there in a way that's, you know, spoilerific. So if you haven't read the, the visual novel or you don't want to kind of experience it for yourself, you know, like, if you want to do that, you probably should step away now. Otherwise, things are pretty solid here. It's just kind of time for us to get talking about things and kind of just be able to share kind of the stuff I've learned. Um, because th there was a lot. There's a lot of density here. And I ironically, I got a lot of stuff right. Uh, before I go too much further, though, I wanted to give a shout out to Tenacious Rodent, who is our most recent member on the YouTube channel. Uh, nice thing is it gives me notifications whenever that happens now, so uh, you can pretty much count on if you become an official member of the channel, I'll be able to give you a direct shout out on the next live stream, whatever that is. So, thank you for Tenacious Rodent. Uh, you are, of course, going to be in the uh, thank you card of future videos. Uh, I've already got you all set up for that, so keep your eye out for that. Uh, but thank you for being a lab member and supporting the channel and uh, helping me find the means to grow. Anyway, let's get talking about this. I don't know. It's interesting because, like, uh, it the package is really well put together, but it, it's not like it's both like Doki Doki Literature Club and not like Doki Doki Literature Club. I can see why people would make that comparison. I think that's kind of what the pitch was initially when I first heard about this game. It wasn't like they they I think they didn't want to spoil anything, but at the same time, like they had to try and make it stand out, and so they said like if you liked Doki Doki, you'll like this. So it wasn't like it was trying to hide that there was something going on. And that's what the difference is. Doki Doki really tried to put up a real strong facade that this was just a dating sim and it became something different. Like, this started different. Like, it, it doesn't take more than five minutes to start uh, understanding that there's something very wrong going on. And as things ascend into madness, you kind of are along for the ride the whole way. You don't have to be persuaded or uh, you don't have to be... Um, push to knowing and understanding kind of like what exactly is going on because like it's pretty apparent from the surface right on the top um and and this uh, right in the name of course like doki doki literature club is very cutesy sounding it's obviously kind of hiding the horror within type of scene cooking companion sounds very positive but it also is very literal because they're literally cooking companions that's literally what happens in the story so it, it's very interesting how that happens but I wasn't too far off in some of my recollections, so I'm kind of going to go over that a little bit. So, uh, what you want to should know, what I've learned, is that the story that we had through episode, I think, two or three, which ends with Karen's, the fight with Karen in the basement, and that kind of resulted that fight. That's where the game actually ended. That was like the initial release. Everything after that was technically part of a DLC that they released, but I don't think they charged for the DLC. If they did, I just, I never saw any evidence for that. Um, of course, I mean, you're allowed to charge for DLC, but I think they just kind of added, especially as it became really successful, um, you know, the passion of the, the creators shown through and they decided they wanted to kind of bring more uh, answers and like plot to the surface. The stuff that like they hinted at, but hadn't really been able to nail down. In the narrative so we're gonna talk a little bit about that i'm also gonna talk about i was pretty on the money when it came to like where the um inspiration for the the story came from the slavic like folklore but i did get to learn a lot of good detail um i gotta give a big shout out of course to matt pat and uh, game theory i knew they'd made videos on this on this game i even said so in my first episode so i finally um went and watched them afterwards and he and his team were able to kind of through like really intense diligence piece together a few more details and and uh reveal a few things that i just wasn't able to find nor do i think i would have been capable of finding oh hello honoring thanks for joining me like this again is just a rap party cooking companions i'm just gonna be talking about my opinion about the game as a whole and i also do an announcement at the end of this about the game we're going to be covering next so thank you for joining me if you have any thoughts or any like points of view you want to share directly like i keep an eye on the chat so if you wanted to bring something up in particular 
um, comment on the wonderful artwork that we're observing or whatever. Like, uh, I'm, I'm there for you. So thank you for joining me. And uh, yeah, let's continue forward. So it's not too far of a stretch to understand that the storyline is based on the story of the Baba Yaga. Essentially, it's the boogeyman slash witch story of Slavic folklore. Uh, the Baba Yaga tends to be a bit more localized, not so much to like Nordic Slavia, but to more inland Slavia. So uh, Bolivia, Russia, um, and, like it, it's trickled into Norway and, and um, uh, Sweden as far as I know, but it definitely has its roots more in the inland section, Ukraine, uh, which is kind of part of why the setting is what it is. Uh, because the Baba Yaga is this idea. And the funny thing is, I also mentioned the story about Hansel and Gretel. I'm pretty sure that Hansel and Gretel, if it wasn't directly related to the Baba Yaga, was inspired by the folk stories told as the Baba Yaga, but, you know, was obviously simplified or, or localized for the, where the Grimm brothers were from. And, or, or like, you know, like word of mouth likely it spread like over the years and kind of turn the story into something slightly different where it's like instead of a, a cabin in the woods it's a it's a cabin made of food uh, but the but premise is still very much the same the idea and the essentials being that there's something in the cabin that appears human but as some but slightly something's off about them and that they are cannibalistic by nature um so why why this story and again it's one of those things too like i remember always asking myself growing up when i was like because I, I remember like growing up hearing fairy tales uh being a big fan of them because i've always loved stories and books and then you get to the, the age eventually where you learn about like a lot where a lot of our fairy tales come from the great the grimm's fairy tales and you hear the real versions like the old old versions that they used to tell back in the day at least the recorded ones that we have access to and you find that they're all very, like, horrific. They're full of blood, they're full of sacrifice, they're full of, like, murder, and and, and people doing these really extreme things uh, because they can. I mean, I remember the first hearing the Cinderella story and how when the prince was coming around with the glass slipper trying to find whoever the girl was he'd met at the ball, um, Cinderella was locked in her room, and her sisters knowing that she was the girl who fit the slipper were determined to make sure that she didn't get picked and so like they tried to fit their feet into her uh the other slipper that she had because they want to try and make sure that they could fit and so her their mom like cuts off parts of their feet to make sure they can fit obviously that doesn't work the prince is like why are your feet like bleeding <laughs> like but like the idea that like they would go to those lengths is just horrific like it's crazy anyway um, Hungry, you say, don't don't really know anything about this VN, but I figured drop and say hi, since you were live, you should do these rap parties. Yes, I do. Okay, so, um, it's good if, if you, I would recommend, honestly, this is kind of like what I call a capstone. Um, uh, the rap party reference is a reference, uh, from when I used to work for a, uh, school board new newspaper system. Uh, rap party was the last get-together we had before we published, and so we would stay extra late and kind of make sure that we wrapped up all of our projects kind of made sure everything was like addressed that needed to be addressed all the editing that needed to be edited and then we send it off and it would be complete considered finished because that's the thing is like when a newspaper is being distributed most people are getting access to the stories firsthand but to the publisher and the writer that's the final product and that's the last time we we typically want to see it because we're like done with it so i call it a rap party this is where whenever i finish a visual novel i have a no holds bar full disclosure conversation where i just talk about everything i can like usually it's about me like talking about endings i don't cover alive on the channel uh it's about me like going into deep dives like i've been doing right now about folklore that's involved with the story it's just my chance to do that so yeah honestly because this game is so is so cheap and or like i'm pretty sure you can even play half of it for free i recommend just playing it just because it's an experience uh but and so like don't spoil things too much for yourself but if you're watching this you've already been spoiled a little bit but it's still worth going through so Thank you for coming to say hi. But yeah, if you ever come across a rap party, um, I usually just do them as a live ending. It's an also, and the reason why I do it live is so that anyone who's been following the series, if they want to pop in live, they can pop in just like you are, and I can actually talk about and address certain things. Because sometimes I might overlook a character or a perspective that they wanted to hear my opinion on. 
So it's just a chance for the for the for the uh, community to pop in. But I, I honestly, usually it's just me, and and that's perfectly fine. I think we've had bigger audiences for some of the more mainstream titles, uh, like Mub Love, Steins Gate. Uh, for smaller titles like this one, I'm not too surprised that we don't get a ton of people by, but that's perfectly fine. I'm always used to recording in a room by myself anyway, so it's not really that big a difference for me. And again, it lets me get these thoughts out that I've, I would normally do, get anyway. Like, it's just better for me to do it as a vid, as a live broadcast. Uh, you say, Hanring says, uh, that's awesome. Love how much you enjoy talking about VNs and the games you play. Absolutely. That's the thing. Like, is it going to be anything that sets me apart? Because it's definitely not going to be uh, like overwhelming charisma or like a uh, sense of humor. I, I, I love to laugh, but I'm not great at making other people laugh. Uh, what you're going to get from me and what I know my bread and butter really is, is my passion for the stories. Like even games that sometimes people just kind of pass over or just say like, meh, I find a lot of enjoyment from because I immerse myself so, so readily into them. So uh, yeah, anything I play. I'm likely find, gonna find silver linings. I'm gonna have stuff I'm gonna praise, but I'm also gonna be critical. I'll have things I won't say, like or, or, or I don't like. So, um, anyway, thank you so much. I'll continue on now. So, as I talked about folklore, so folklore in its original form, back when it was originally being so, like kind of peddled and shared, um, was almost like, almost like what we like, like the like the like the it's like the old school version of snuff stories but the thing is like these were things that people would just talk about around the, the campfire regularly but you know you got to remember that's an age when people not only didn't have internet but they most like didn't have books like they just told stories i'm sure they had lots of happy stories but they also had a lot of like negative ones and i'm guessing that the horror stories stuck a little more like kind of like this image Ugh. um there's something about it that just like you can't it, like i imagine that there's a sea full of just like happy ending stories good stories that were plentiful around the time because lots of people like hearing happy stories but because of that it means that the times when the more horrific or grim stories came around they stick and they had a they had a propensity to be long lasting so a lot of the stories that ended up lasting into the modern age started out as horror stories and then often are dumbed down and uplifted to make them more appealing which is what the common typically people enjoy a happy story more but most of the ones we cherish growing up start as the horror stories and i think it's that psychological connection of like the horror stories are easier to retell in their like true form because they're so memorable and impactful so Whilst this is a smaller game, it has a very powerful effect on your mind. And I walked away from this being like, yeah, I'm not going to forget this anytime soon. All right, so I want to get a little bit into the depth of the Baba Yaga itself. This is stuff that I pieced together from the game, a little bit from Wikipedia, and a little bit from Matt Pat and his team and the work that they did. So it's going to be a pretty summarized version on... I really highly recommend you look up game theories, cooking companion videos, and like if you want to really get some of the in-depth stuff. Um, he has just a good way of, of his team putting together content as well. So, what is it exactly, the Baba Yaga? I think it is a reflection of the horrors of the dark side of humanity. Because even to this day, Genuine, like, survival-necessitated cannibalism happens. It's not common anymore, but it happens. And it's something that can get glossed over because it's so dark that even though dark things make good headlines, the subject of eating people never sits well. So why would you tell a story about a witch sitting in a cabin that eats people? Well, I think it's because it happened and you need to have a way to kind of process it. Because when you're walking through the wilderness at a, at the spring and you happen upon a campsite or a cabin that's just kind of degraded and you look inside and you find a bunch of skeletons with bone with with human teeth marks on the bones like they did with the Donner party in the uh, eight, late 1800s in the United States you kind of have to cope with it. You have to have an explanation for it. And whilst we all, like the adults, understand 
what happened. You don't want to say it because it makes it too real. It makes it too horrific. And that's what the Baba Yaga, I think, is for. The Baba Yaga is a way I think parents found to help teach children that people sometimes eat people, but that it's really bad and should never be done, that only monsters do that. But that's not entirely true. And that's and we're gonna touch a bit on that. I like uh, some of the stuff that Bat Pat was able to dig up with his team, uh, really touches on that aspect. So I'll talk about that in a little bit. But so why the Baba Yaga? So Baba Yaga is a boogeyman character that can be used to help explain away the horrors of a really rough winter to children who are not quite at the level of being able to understand or really like process what that could be if they find that their uncle's bones have been found eaten picked clean by people like you can't tell them like oh yeah your uncle got eaten by his neighbors like that that's not something you can tell a kid even if you want to like it wouldn't it wouldn't like go through properly and it would also be so traumatizing it just wouldn't be worth it so baba yaga is a kind of good scapegoat for that you say oh no the baba yaga got them you gotta be careful don't wander in the woods they're like don't get lost in the woods because if you do the Baba Yaga might find you and you'll never come home. Like, it's a it's a story to try and teach a lesson, and that lesson being, like, don't stray too far away, don't get lost, and be careful to, to take care of your food. These are survival things, and so if you can teach kids this, it teaches them very profound and impactful lessons that can come ingrained in them before they even are adults. And, like, honestly, that's important. It's a, it's a survival tactic. Um, it has side effects. The side effects often can be these stories can be blown up proportion. Sometimes they can be taken to great extremes. Sometimes they get believed so di- so fervently that you can actually spawn like religious mythos about it and start having people worshiping the things that you start telling these stories about. And that could be whole another ball of yarn. But what about the Baba Yaga? Uh, so there's a lot of Baba Yaga facts that are pretty funny that are, or interesting. For instance, the Baba Yaga, like, um, has a cabin in the woods, but instead of just being a cabin, it's a cabin that walks on chicken legs. And I think this is supposed to be because, kind of like the idea of a Santa Claus, where, like, you have an explanation for something mysterious that happens. For Santa Claus, it's leaving presents in the home. For Baba Yaga, it's finding man-eaten corpses in the forest. So, how do you explain that multiple cities and multiple towns have the same story, well, that's because the Baba Yaga can get it around. And so, like, oh, sometimes it involves a cabin, like a person living in a cabin who cuts people up. Because that's the thing, like, they find cabins and they find people, the remains of people have been cut up. So they have to say, like, oh, that must be the Baba Yaga's cabin. So how does, how does the cabin get around? Like, why does every village seem to have a story about the Baba Yaga? Well, the cabin has legs, obviously, so it can travel around. It's a very, um, it's a very old-timey uh, solution. To that problem but at the same time like what are we talking about santa claus oh he has a magic sleigh with reindeer that fly i mean that's absurd too but you know it works so society accepts it and that's all that matters essentially so why does the cabin have chicken legs because the cabin has to be available for all cult- uh, all different cities and towns in the culture now what's another interesting thing is that for some reason they also have a story about the baba yaga traveling at high speed but where uh, more like, um, you know, European, Central, and uh, Western nations tend to have like witches flying on broomsticks, which again is very strange. Um, Baba Yaga goes in style by traveling in a giant mortar and pestle. Not really sure why. Again, though, it might, it, like, you've no- I've noticed that almost everything involving the Baba Yaga involves food because that's kind of, again, the premise of the story of her, like, her story. The Baba Yaga story is about food, lack of it. So the cabin doesn't just walk around on, like, stilts or big tree trunks. No, it walks around on chicken legs. Chicken legs being considered a, well, it's a portion of, a f- of food and in some cultures is actually a delicacy. Like, but I would consider like it's a symbol of, of poverty or extremism because most people wouldn't choose to eat chicken legs. But if you're running out of food, they'd start looking a lot more appealing than your neighbors. So 
it's another, I think, subtle nod to like what the concept of Baba Yaga stands for. And again, same thing with the Mortar Pestle. Mortar Pestle is about breaking up herbs and spices and uh, other materials in order to make them more consumable and more, um, you know, distributable. So the Baba Yaga having a giant mortar and pestle, she flies around the forest and then she'll catch you and she'll throw you inside and mash you up. It's like, it's terrifying, but at the same time, it falls again in line with the whole idea that she's kind of this mad cook in the woods. And that's the thing too, like traditionally it's been a she, but I got the impression from the stories that it's not really like a consistent thing. Like a witch typically was almost always a female. Uh, it's like in West in Western, like, culture and western history that's like almost always the case like they're like they're exceptions but they tend to be a bit more modern takes on the concept in the old days like witch just typically meant a female who like brokered with the dark powers now baba yaga also seems to be more inclined towards being witch-like but i think that's a bit more of that the western story getting kind of creeping in because if you look at the actual sources it looks a lot more like the Baba Yaga was gender neutral. It could be a boy or a girl, and that fits a lot more in line with what we see with the story. It's like, the Baba Yaga is a thing. It doesn't really have a gender, because it doesn't have a people, it doesn't have a culture, it doesn't have a community. It is an isolated creature, human in appearance, but not human at all. And so why would it have a gender? Because that's a thing that humans have. Um, so like, it's really interesting in seeing that idea. So like, Getting caught up on the on the the gender is a, is a silly thing when when what matters is the monster within. So the Baba Yaga represents food, lack thereof, and provides a scapegoat for people to be able to express themselves and be like, look, this is what happens when, like, when you find human remains that were clearly eaten and processed. This is how you help people comprehend and cope with that because that's a very terrifying thing to have to deal with especially if you want to try and keep a community from panicking. It's a lot easier to blame an nebulous power that can just appear and disappear and like, oh no, we, no, like everyone's been safe. No one's gone missing in the past month. Okay, the Baba Yaga must have moved on. We're all happy now. We're all safe now. Not wanting to con contemplate that someone in your community might have been the one to do those horrific things and they might still just be there trying to hide because they're, they are ashamed or, or terrified of what they what they had to do. Now, so that's the Baba Yaga. And uh, granted also, like a lot of the dreams that you have, like we had some dream sequences that were often tailored to us, like doing these terrible acts. They also reflected a lot of like the collection of various like folklore stories of people interacting with the Baba Yaga. And the Baba Yaga almost always gets defeated, being shoved in her own oven, being tossed into the river Styx, uh, being, um, having their eye plucked out. Like, these are all stories involving the Baba Yaga. And so, like, each of those dreams, including a few that we didn't see, are very much related to that. Now, we have established now the Baba Yaga as an entity. I want to focus now on the characters. Because remember how I thought it was really odd and telling how the characters seem to be refugees from Ukraine? Well, this is the context that um, I really got specifically from Game Theory because they were able to do some digging that I just didn't really know where to start with when it comes to this. Like, I, it would have taken me a long time to find it. Uh, but their research talks about how, like, if you put together some of the notes that we... I found some, but I didn't find all of them. But if you find all of them and you listen to all the characters' dialogue trees, you do get this impression that, like... The main game with Mariah and Gregor and Anatoly and uh, Karen all is happening in the um, 20th century sometime. Like, almost modern but not quite. And he's able to kind of nail down that it seems to be happening in like, I think he said the, uh, yeah, like the 1920s, 1930s. And it involves a very real thing that happened in Ukraine. When the Soviet Union really rose up the power after the rebellions and like the 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 the, 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 the chaos of the Reformation where they transitioned fully into communism, uh, Stalin ass uh, you know, assimilated power in the, the states that he had taken over essentially that, that were joined whether by force or otherwise. Um, underneath the, the the umbrella of the Soviet Union, 
he was very harsh. His uh, retribution very clear. And a big part of it was because, especially in a post-revolution like nation, they had very little resources, they had a lot of people, and not a lot to go around. So, it became pretty obvious, you know, if you're going to have some people who are going to be left wanting, and if you're going to have people be angry at your government, your brand new government, by the way, which is always the scariest part of a government before you have an established, like, rule, like, like rule of law, um, people are less likely to just go with the flow. So, when you have so much, you know you're going to have upheaval and resistance, because you just don't have enough food to go around, because of the combination of like so much destroyed property during the revolution and a really really rough winters so you have no you don't have enough food for everybody so do you just try and make everyone starve equally making generally everyone angry or do you do you directly support those who are most supportive of your government and completely screw over your dissidents well that's exactly what happened there were these horrific famines that were instigated by Stalin's government in several areas, but Ukraine was hit really, really hard. They had a particular year where the Ukrainians' food was seized by the government, so their farmers were essentially raided and had almost everything taken from them by force. But then when it was redistributed, because the way communism was supposed to work is that everyone contributes in, and then everything gets redistributed evenly so everyone can have their needs met. Well... The needs of everyone couldn't be met, so Stalin withheld giving back any of such grain and material to peoples who were in rebellion, and Ukraine was one of the most, like, like resistant to the unification of the Soviet Union. They, they wanted independence. They were kind of overturned by, you know, rule of, oh, I have armies. <laughs> so they were inducted, but a lot of their people really didn't want to be a part of it and were essentially, like, in soft rebellion. So Stalin said, you know what? Screw you guys. I'm going to take all your food and then you're not getting any back. And so he forcibly put them into a position where even though they'd had the food to survive, they lost it all. And so Mariah talks about it. It's something we did see in my playthrough. She kind of relates about how like as bad as things were in the are in the cabin, she makes a comment saying something like, at least if we're still not in Ukraine. It was worse. And back in, like, I think it was 1932, if I'm recalling correctly, like, Ukraine specifically was forced into that position so that they went through a winter where the entire society of Ukraine fell to pieces because they had just no food, barely had enough blankets. And it really came down to this idea that, like, like, it came down to, like, the survivors had to eat people like it had to come down to cannibalism to, to survive and they even talked about how like kind of the reason why i think i'm super screwed if the world ever goes to hell because uh it talked about how like the first people to go were the old the innocent and those who would not sully their hands the people who refused to consume others out of basic principle and humanity, starved, and thus were processed into saving those who were willing to go that far to survive. And that struggles what the first part of this game is really all about. It's about that idea of like, oh, when you're up against the wall and you have no way of surviving, do you take that plunge as much as it horrifies you as much as it's wrong and twists you and like you never could come away being the same again do you still cook your companions because why should all of you die when at least only but when the death of the few can save can save the, the 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 many or like or the rest there's a cool very real logic to that a logic that can't be denied because the other option is suicide by starvation and i think while it sounds abhorrent when it comes really down to survival can you really hold it against them were the people who survived the crisis famine of ukraine bad people for doing what it took to keep themselves and their families alive I really don't think so.
I think that there's no hell for those people because they had to go through it already. I think it would be foolish to believe that being backed into such a corner is that they, to, to, to blame somebody for, for you know doing what needed to be done to survive. But that's kind of what the horror of the Baba Yaga is. Because in those instances, the really horrifying thing is that, kind of like Karen, of the dozens of people who might get pushed into that extreme, there's going to be the few who mentally either are, were of a psychopathic tendency already, or who break due to the psychological horror of what they've had to do, somehow develop a taste for it. And it stops becoming a, like, desperation, but more of a fascination. And that's kind of another thing. The Baba Yaga is a scapegoat for the people who perpetuate this type of extreme survivalism purposefully. Because as much as it sounds horrible, there are the monsters that do that. And so giving them a name is kind of necessary. But yeah, like, I know that the Soviet Union's history was rough. And we're seeing right now that it has lingering roughness still out of the crazy events. And uh, it sucks that Ukraine seems like it's always the one under the barrel, isn't it? Like, why is it always them? So, just, it's, it's good to, A, remember, if you are safe and you're warm and you have your family and you don't have to eat people to survive, we should all be really, really grateful that we're not in that terrible position. And if we are living in a world or living in, in states that are currently at war and facing these trials and frustrations, regardless of what side you're on, like, I can blame countries and their leaders for the really awful things they do, but I can't go as far as saying, like, oh, because you're a citizen or you're associated or even remotely around such people that you are evil, too. That's a personal, it's a pace by case basis. There's definitely monsters involved in the whole, like, um conflict in Ukraine right now and we've seen evidence of that we also see evidence of a lot of people on both sides who are just really trying the best not to just die you know and can you blame them no you really can't that's why Baba Yaga's exist because we need to be able to have somebody we can just blame for evil things that happen because if you learn about who actually does stuff that did those things and why most of the time we can't help but be sympathetic, but we also can't condone it. So we have, we're erecting the boogeyman is this way, again, for us to deal with these horrors, with the real harsh realities. We make a fable that helps soften that blow. That reality makes it a little more digestible. So, yeah. That's really the biggest thing about it, is, re is remembering that, like, like, Anatoly and Mariah and Karen and uh, Gregor, they were fleeing essentially the same thing. They were caught in a, perpetu a, per in a per perpetuity that they could never have predicted. And that's why they went to they turned to cannibalism so quickly. Because they were fleeing with nothing. And like, they had already gone days without eating. They were already at their last legs when they found the cabin. And the idea was that we as the character we already lived at the cabin as the beast. By the way, that was the thing too. Like, remember, um, they the it, when the on the kind of flashback it did when they first showed up at the cabin. Uh, we, you know, the Baba Yaga asked the question. We said, um, "Did you come here of your own volition, or did you, or were you compelled?" This is the start of the story. I just don't understand, really. Like, it's really fascinating, though, because there's a tr there is a right answer. If you give the right answer, the Baba Yaga spares you, or at least gives you opportunity to leave. Um, because every fictional story has to have, like, a scapegoat, because, like, that way people go home not terrified of the Baba Yaga, because they're like, oh, I know the secret. I can get away. You know, like, I, I, if I run into the Baba Yaga, I can escape. I'll be safe, because I know the secret. So the secret's just kind of part of the narrative. But oddly... The, the secret isn't so much of like, uh, like, oh, you know, like for, for vampires, it's garlic and crosses. And, um, like, for, for elves, it's na knowing their names. Um, for the Baba Yaga, the Baba Yaga asks you the question, like, did you come here of your own free will or were you compelled? 
And the answer is supposed to be 75% of my own will, 65% compelled. I don't know why. Maybe it's just supposed to be a nature of the fact that, like, a, a kind of a hinting at this idea of, like, when pushed to extremes for survival, like, like, there's a con you're com you are compelled. There's an aspect that is pushing you beyond, like, the ability to just w wish it away. But also that, like, in order to take that step, you have to be willing to take it. That you have to, more than your compulsion, you have to be driven by determination that you built up. So maybe that's part of it, too. But yeah, so they didn't answer that, which meant that they were doomed. Um, the other thing that's really interesting is that this story takes a kind of um, a personalized story, which is kind of the story that you go with the Chompettes and with, like, the main cast. Is that the Baba Yaga is more of a curse rather than a specific person because so it makes a pretty clear picture of something we got to see and like matt pat's green team kind of confirmed raziel is likely who we are as the character um because raziel was vanished and the, so like the chompettes who they were as, in person like as people were trying to track them down because they thought he was gone or had been killed uh instead it looked like he'd been apprenticed by the baba yaga and then when the baba yaga started to kill his friends he ended up killing the Baba Yaga, and then it's unclear whether he then killed his friends and devoured them, or if he devoured them because they were already dead. I'm not too sure. Regardless of that, though, um, he kind of became the successor, and that's kind of, that's what the potato is. Of the Chompettes, the potato is the one with the knife, the one that's different, the one that tends to be a bit more real and down to earth and not like loopy. And that's because it was the original Baba Yaga. His soul is trapped in the house. And yet he also still influences and teaches you. And like the idea of the story is that like the curse of the Baba Yaga is that you have the eternal hunger for human flesh. But the boon is that you have some perpetual uh, ability to perpetuate your own life, to live for hundreds of years. Because I even did some of those calculations. Remember, we had two dates that kind of came up. One of the dates was early 1900s, which co coincides with Raziel and with this, like, not, not uh, with like 1800s, which coincides with the story of Raziel and the Chompettes. And then we had another one that took that went back to like, was it like 1630? Who likely was the start of the previous Baba Yaga when they first succumbed to the hunger. And then it also shows this idea about how. The, perpetua uh, per the perpetuation of the monster with Karen. The idea that Karen, of all the all the, all the guests, really kind of got gung-ho about it and even started taking the initiative of preparing and cooking and devouring human flesh on her own volition, becoming addicted to it, becoming the monster that you were. And then it kind of came down to a duel between the two of you. Ugh, sorry. A duel between the two of you. And the trumpets even say, like, if she, if you, if you lose, she will take over the cabin. They essentially said that she'd started the process of becoming a Baba Yaga, and it kind of comes down to there can only be one. Uh, very Sith Lord esque, this idea of like a master and an apprentice. A master who understands, an apprentice who learns, and that eventually the apprentice becomes strong enough that they fight, and the, the stronger survives and continues to go on the mantle. So Karen was being primed and was prepared to become the new Baba Yaga. Uh, and it was kind of, it just kind of came down to whether we were able to defeat her or not in her strengthened form. And we still held on. So she was defeated, didn't become a Baba Yaga. We maintained our title as it were and moved forward. And that's a really interesting idea because that's, that's what I would consider a bit more of a modern take to the narrative. The idea that the Baba Yaga isn't a person it's a it's like a curse or uh like Mepat talked about the idea of it being an entity like something that possesses i'm not too sure if that's quite the case because if that were true then why was potato like equated to have a soul like all the other chompettes like he had some kind of re a remnant of some kind a, ki a kind of intelligence that seemed a bit sub uh separated from the, the raw like cannibalistic tendencies so I think it's a curse. I think it's more of a aspect of, like, an inevitable, like, perversion of the person who indulges willingly in cannibalism. The idea, and that's another thing, like, kind of the capstone to all of this is this idea that part of the narrative of the Baba Yaga includes elements that if you participate in these types of things, you will become a monster. 
And that's really what this story is about. It's about becoming a monster and what that entails. So yeah, very fascinating. Very, very interesting. I really enjoyed this playthrough because it really just brought up a lot of really interesting questions. And I have to give props. The sound quality, ambiance, and surround sound, uh, like... Uh, efforts they went through were fantastic. Having surround sound headphones with this game was horrifying. Uh, it's because the whispers and like the languages, like they would come from around different positions. And like towards the end, there was a point where we were hearing whispers as we went to the basement, and they were supposed to be the whispers of like the the, the four victims before Karen, you know, like Anatoly, <sighs> Anatoly, Mariah, Gregor, um, like they're supposed to be whispering at you. And the thing is, like, they, it sounded like they were whispering, like, to my sides and behind me as you were going down the stairs. And it was just bone chilling. So bravo for such a small team's first game. Not only did they go above and beyond what I would expect for the, for the pricing of the game itself, but they really showcased um, a talent that I wish I had. They knew how to tell a story and they knew how to capture an atmosphere. They knew how to create characters that you could bond with very quickly. They each had a distinct like uh, like attitude and um, personality to them, because it didn't take long for me to be sad to see these characters slowly one by one fading into the we in, uh, fading away into the basement. Um, even though I only had a few interactions with each of them, so Bravo! It is a wonderful case study in how to write a story and present it. Uh, especially on a budget because I guarantee you like they they had a budget it was probably pretty strict and they really did a fantastic job so thank you to the creators thank you to the Kickstarter people who made the game possible and thank you to people who recommended it to me and who uh, perpetuated yet another great game like this that doesn't just go out to tell a story but to quite to, to, to teach you things to, to make you look for answers and to try and make a story not so much about just getting from beginning to the end, but about making it a journey, which is part of what makes visual novels so great to begin with. Even though this one didn't really have a branching narrative per se, it still had a way that you got to interact with it on your own terms. It gave you mysteries to discover, things to dig through, and ways to kind of make the story come alive in, your way, in the way you experienced it which is the personification of why I love visual novels. It's because as a medium, they just can do things in ways that no other medium can. And it's a really good example of that. So yeah, that's pretty much it. We're going to be wrapping things up here. Thank you so much for anyone who showed up live. Again, thank you Tenacious Rodent for being a recent member to the channel. I appreciate you joining. Um, and I also am really grateful that those of you who are listening to this in post uh, have done so. Hopefully you'll have some comments to share. I always look at those. But we're getting to the point where we need to start winding down. Because we are ready for one of my favorite parts about all this. Which is the announcement of what is coming up next. Now, uh, this is always fun. But especially this time, if you're still here, I appreciate you for being here. We'll be switching gears here in just a second. But I just want to give a quick shout out to my patrons and now members. YouTube memberships are just started on the channel. It's something I qualify for. YouTube was bugging me to start and I finally kind of reconciled it. It's essentially going to be the same as being a patron member. You just become an official lab member. You can uh, support as long as you want. The trouble with it is if you do support on YouTube, it can be really convenient. But at the same time, it does mean that you need to contact me directly either like through YouTube or through the discord to make sure I give you full access to everything. So if you are a member and you don't have access to the uh, discord where you, where you don't have your um, name in yellow or purple to signify like, like what, like how, like your support of the channel and you don't have access because of that role, those roles, which is like a lab member or Asumi's Valkyries. Um, those roles give you access to a Patreon specific section of chat rooms uh, where I post behind the scenes. I post podcasts for the patrons, which is just kind of a little bit, again, like I said, behind the scenes. We also do voting and that voting is about to become a lot more in depth. I've been talking about it a lot because I want to make sure the message gets out there. But again, just to reiterate, 
I used to kind of restrict the kind of content we covered on Fridays. It used to be games that were either given to me directly from developers or games that were from like newer developers who didn't get as much spotlight, kind of like Cooking Companions. This was their first game they ever made. Um, I really want to make sure that we always make room for people who are making new visual novels and pushing the limits and trying new things because, frankly, we need more of that and we want to make sure we make time for it. But I have decided I am going to make just that aspect mine because I think it made the voting that people who are joining the channel and being like you are supporting it directly, it gave them such limited options. And I kind of don't like that. I wanted to make sure we got something dynamic and exciting. So the shackles are off. Wednesdays are likely going to become the new like small developer day where I just kind of pick based on like the content that I find or is sent to me that I think is a good match. Fridays are going to become what Wednesdays currently are. And that is essentially free to whatever. Ideally, not super long daisy chain series. Like, Muv Love has been Monday, Muv Love Monday for ages. Uh, it was Fata Morgana for a while. And it's going to become uh, Higurashi and Umineko very shortly. Uh, but these are like project series. They're series that, like, you really got to sink your teeth into and go for the long haul. And I need to make sure that they have a space. And that space is Monday. So what Fridays are going to become is going to be a little looser. They might have series and they might have sequels, but we're not going to be so serialized with them. We'll likely jump around between different titles. And when that's already going to be the case anyway, why not let the community, especially those members of the community who have like directly supported the channel, let them have the fun of really dictating the direction. So I narrow down a list based on recommendations that I hear on Discord from everybody, not just from the patrons. And I narrow down that list to like a, a, to a cultivated choice of like three or four, and then the patrons and the members get to vote on it, which is what they did this week. So I am now happy to take a bit of a step back as I wrap up this wrap party and my final goodbye after I, after after I say goodbye before this ends will be the official announcement through trailer of what we will start next Friday. So thank you so much for being here. Thank you for watching. I hope you've enjoyed yourselves. And uh, yeah, uh, stick around to, to see the announcement. And uh, look, I look forward to sharing a brand new series starting next Friday. So until next video, watch me. If you see me next, I'll see you there. Bye.